good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. We used to be almost the only one saying that, but for the past two years, everyone starts a meeting with uh, uh, this. So very happy to be back. And I realized that it's almost one year we haven't uh, held any tax talk. So we're very excited to be with you today. Uh, I would introduce uh, the uh, squad uh, right now. I think you all have heard uh, uh, from and about Dr. Pross, uh, who uh, is the master of Pillar 2 and also of Pillar 1. You all know Melissa de Jong, uh, who has participated and uh, has been involved in both pillars. Uh, and uh, I think you've also met uh, Felicie Bonnet, uh, who uh, has been a key pillar of Pillar 2. Uh, now, we uh, are very glad to introduce two newcomers. Actually, they are not that new uh, in CTP, in the Center for Tax Policy and Administration, uh, but they are new to the tax talks. Uh, I mean uh, Manuel de los Santos, who is uh, the head of the Transfer Pricing Unit, and Lee Harley, who's the head of the Tax Treaty Unit. Lee, uh, replacing Sophie Chatel, who left us and uh, went uh, to be elected in Canada as a member of Parliament. Uh, bonjour, Sophie, si tu nous écoutes. If we can move on uh, to uh, the uh, overview of what we're going to discuss today, and we'll try to be as quick as possible to leave room to a Q&A session, even though we have so much to tell you that uh, we may take uh, too much time. General update, which uh, I will do. Then we'll have a pillar one update, uh, a pillar two update, and uh, other work streams. I thought that as we had not met for one year, it would be fair to go through a few work streams uh, which uh, are not core to the major deal reached on the 8th of October, but still quite important. Uh, so let me just move right now to the general update and start with the latest, uh, which is what has happened for the past year. An agreement on the uh, 1st of July, which was finalized on the 8th of October. I think we can speak uh, of a landmark agreement, a historic agreement, whatever uh, qualifying word you want to put, uh, but uh, a big agreement. 136 members of the inclusive framework joined on the 8th of October and Mauritania joined uh, more recently, bringing to 137 members. You know, Pillar One, your reallocation of taxing rights for in scope companies, plus an amount B, which is extremely important. And Manuel will uh, walk you through uh, the state of play on amount B. A Pillar Two, made of two components as well. The globe rules on uh, one hand with the global minimum tax of 15% through the income inclusion rule and the tax payment rule for companies above 750 million euros of turnover and a subject to tax rule. And uh, Lee uh, will walk you through the STTR as well. Finally, we adopted a detailed implementation plan, which we are currently uh, deploying. And that's what these um, um, tax talks will largely be about. Next is uh, the um, 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 agreement. Um, uh, I go very quickly because uh, the team will describe pillar two, pillar one. I started with pillar two because it was slightly more advanced than pillar one, and this still uh, is slightly more advanced to pillar one. Uh, some global rules have already been approved. The commentary is about to being approved and released publicly. Uh, and we also um, um, we, we have also seen some countries already implementing uh, Pillar 2. I would like to mention the European Union, which was first to shoot on 22nd of December, drawing on the model rules uh, that we had elaborated. And the French presidency of the European Union has made this a top priority. Uh, with an informal ECOFIN at the end of the week, where I think this topic will be mentioned. We have the UK, which uh, went for a public consultation. We even heard from Switzerland, which announced it will change its constitution to be able to have Peter II implemented in Switzerland with a minimum tax of 15% the 1st of January 2024, which is quite record time given uh, the pace of the Swiss democracy, which takes uh, a lot of time because it's extremely 
democratic. Uh, and we also heard more recently from the United Arab Emirates. So you, we can see some, some big uh, move uh, there. Pillar one uh, will require a multilateral convention, which we are working on. It's the task force on the digital economy, which acts uh, with um, um, a dual format, we could say, one where uh, they seek technical agreement on each of the different building blocks and one uh, where more formally it does negotiate the multilateral convention, which should be ready to sign for signing by mid-year, which is what the detailed implementation plan provides for. Next is a long text, I will not read it, it's more for reference to you all. It's the G20 communique, which was approved, I think, on Saturday morning. Um, it was morning somewhere in the world, probably in Jakarta or elsewhere. Uh, and you can see uh, the first part of it, we'll go back to the second part, which talks about other work streams. But the first part of it is just about the G20 finance ministers reiterating their support and their commitment to the delivery of pillar one and pillar two within the agreed time frame you can see will come into effect at the global level in 2023 they welcome the progress made on pillar two they call for swift implementation of pillar one and uh, they mentioned bespoke technical assistance for developing countries to support all aspects of implementation. So you can see here that the political momentum has not gone away, it's still here and extremely forceful. Next, I think is uh, the other part of the communique. I, I mentioned that now and we'll go back to it later, but uh, when you read the communique, uh, this time you need to read the main text and then go to the annex for issues for further action these issues are more for other topics, even though the first one is uh, largely uh, linked uh, to the uh, consequences of uh, Peter II on the tax policy, um, uh, tax incentive policy of, of countries. Uh, next and final, I think, for the introduction is um, uh, the move to Pillar 1. So I think now I will move uh, to Arim, it seems to drive you through the current work on Pillar 1. Arim, over to you. Yes, thank you, Pascal, and um, good morning, good afternoon. Um, I will take you through Pillar 1. Um, I will not be alone, you will be leave to hear. Um, um, there will also be Melissa and there will be Manuel that give you a sense. We have relatively little time. We can spend hours on, on Pillar 1. Today we won't, but we are spending days and nights on Pillar 1, rest assured. Um, so what I wanted to say is just a couple of words, I guess, on uh, where we are in the process, and then Melissa will go more specific on questions of revenue sourcing, but you know that we have a paper out, and then Manuel will go on amount B. Um, I think it's also important, as Pascal has just recalled, um, that um, we are working within the timelines that are set for us and that have most recently been repeated last week by the G20 finance ministers. And so that is a timeline that is set and it's within that timeline that we're trying to do our best to not only come up with sensible rules, um, but to also do this in a process that is transparent and engages with um, stakeholders. And so we um, have received, of course, input from business. We have received letters, you know, some letters we like better than others. But I think there is an understanding and that we have responded to that. We have heard the voice that there needs to be a consultation process. And so before at the end of the year, we have started to set up this consultation process. And we've now seen um, the first papers that have come out as part of this consultation process. Um, we do understand um, some of the frustrations that are out there. Um, we're trying to address them um, at the level, I guess, of the Secretary of the Members with as much engagement as is possible within the overall timelines uh, that we have. Um, I think we also note, as some of you have observed, that you know, the timelines are tight for turnaround. Um, we are grateful for those people that have been able to contribute in the, um, uh, the first set of public comments and consultation, and Melissa will talk about this, others will come. We also recognize that, that some of you have spoken and said you know, there's individual pieces on which you comment, but you haven't seen the other pieces, so it's fair to reflect also 
and that you may wish to have commented differently had you known another design element. But that is some of the trade-offs that we have in trying to sort of put documents out early enough and soon enough as soon as they stabilize and not wait until everything is. So we are aware of these points and uh, we bear with you if you bear with us and, and we understand that that process can be somewhat frustrating, but we hope we're now in a good process that we have started, however tight it might be. So then with that sort of general observation, I think let me just briefly talk to where we are. I have another slide in a second to tell you a little bit about revenue sourcing tax base and the process that we have. And Melissa will say more about this. And then you see here also the other building blocks. That's a chart that we've used before um, that shows you the elements. And so, you know, next in line, so to speak, also in terms of sketching out a bit what to expect in the future without being able to give you a specific date as much as I would like it on each of those. There is the question around scope that has general aspects and then specific aspects on extractives and regulated financial services. And we're advancing on those. We are having discussions in the TFDE, second round, third round discussions in some of these aspects um, and hope to be able to, to get that out um, as a public consultation document around scope, including scope exclusions. Hopefully at the same time, recognizing however, that of course there's also different stakeholders if you speak about the extractives community and the regulated financial services community. Then another block, the next block here, I think that you can see is the tax certainty part. And importantly, not to forget, there is two tax certainty parts that then also come together. Um, there's one, the tax certainty for amount A, the new taxing right, where I think everybody agrees that this is a design of a taxing right that is derived um, from consolidated financial statements. It's, it's something that we, tax and design how this works together. And then there also needs to be a process that is implemented on a multilateral basis. And we can't have a situation where we have different countries auditing different parts at different times. So clearly there we are in the design of an early tax certainty process that will have a binding resolution, um, that will have a, a, a high level of detail also. But I think that is very important as we all recognize that this whole system um, cannot work if it's not underpinned by a strong dimension of tech certainty. And importantly, also linked to that, it's not just about the tech certainty for amount A, it's also tech certainty with respect to aspects related to amount A, which, as you know, can be transfer pricing adjustments that would have an impact also on residual profits. And so it's really a, if you wish, a total tax certainty package for those uh, companies in scope here in particular that we are in the process of developing and then hope to get out on which we are looking forward to comments. We already had, I think, a detailed discussion on the blueprint. We've had inputs from many of you over um, the, the time that we have discussed it, for which we're grateful. And then we will put this up. Then in some sense, a third block, as you wish, is another three issues here, very important from a fiscal perspective, from a design perspective, from an overall perspective of the whole pillar, the elimination of double taxation, the marketing and distribution safe harbor, and the treatment of withholding taxes. And that will be another piece in the consultation process. Then we have administration. We're working on administration in the design of the rules and even the tax certainty process. You can think of part of administration. We are certainly would be interested to create as much as possible that one-stop shop as we can and then see um, how we can work this. I think there's a win-win where tax administrations and taxpayers are both looking for simplicity. So there should be a way through um, in the design of that. Segmentation, of course, is something that is only arising in very limited circumstances, but you know, sort of we need to think about that also for the different dimensions when they're stabilized. And then finally, very important point, unilateral measures. Uh, this whole project is about the stabilization of the tax system. And that also means that there are no unilateral relevant unilateral measures here. So another very important piece of the overall package together with the tax certainty dimension. So maybe that's just a brief overview of sort of what's in the pipeline roughly and breaking it down by element. If I then turn to the next slide, and I think I can be brief on this one. Uh, Nexus and revenue sourcing, Melissa will be speaking about that in a minute, but I'll skip that. Then we have tax-based determination, which we put out on Friday. Um, some people would have liked us to wait until Monday, but we're trying to get it out as soon as we can. So hopefully um, uh, that is well received. We're trying to sort of on a rolling basis, put it out as soon as we have uh, the okay for members to do this. And then, as I said, uh, the other building blocks will come as soon as they have stabilized sufficiently in the discussions and the TFT. So what we're putting out 
is really something that has a degree of stability on which it makes sense to react, whether that can be done, what can be changed, with the, with the view of providing input on the design, et cetera, to make sure that it can actually be implemented by those that are affected. So with that, maybe I give it to Melissa on Nexus and revenue sourcing. Thanks very much. Um, so let me spend a few minutes talking about, I'll spend most of the time on, on revenue sourcing. And just to step back, what are we trying to do with revenue sourcing? So this is about attributing revenue to the market jurisdiction. So the end jurisdiction where goods and services are consumed or used. And we're trying to do that in a way that makes sense across all lines of businesses and different business models. And so let me start, you know, it's been a little bit of a journey. Um, I remember when I started working on revenue sourcing um, and we were starting with consumer goods and you start thinking about, okay, uh, the direct sales to the customer, it's the retail store or the delivery address. And I remember looking around a little bit smug thinking, okay, I can do this, this is fine. Uh, I think then you also see on the other end of the spectrum of this journey, we've had moments, you know, when we started working on cloud computing, when we thought, we don't know what to do here. Um, and I think we've had, you know, all of those shades of gray in between. Um, so I think, you know, where we are now, it's certainly, it's not agreed. Uh, it's not done yet. This was what we've released was a secretariat paper. Um, and everything that I say now is, is certainly secretariat views. But what we're trying to do in, in this journey is, is get the balance right between accuracy and compliance costs, get that balance as good as we can. Um, and so I thought maybe to, to start with just sort of to explain uh, a little bit, if we look at the finished goods rule, um, not, not the technical detail of the rule, but just as an illustration of some of the design principles that you'll see throughout the revenue sourcing rules and how we're trying to strike that balance. Um, so as I say, you, you start with the direct sales and that's easy because there's already a direct relationship with the end market. And then you get to distributors where there's no direct transa transaction with that end market, but you're selling through an unrelated business. And so when we started this, we thought, okay, well, we write a reporting rule and we just get everyone to change their contracts and we get distributors to, to tell the selling business where the goods end up and how much. And I think this was um, the first point where we really had some, some uh, very helpful feedback from business um, to explain to us why that wasn't a viable approach, why you couldn't implement reporting on a massive scale like this, why changing contracts wasn't really just about tax, but there were real competitive issues, that the sheer scale we were talking about. Um, so that, that helped us, I think, not only understand the challenges with where we started, but also to get into problem solving mode. And I think that when you look at sort of the cascade of rules that we have just for finished goods as an illustration, how does it work? So we start with indicators. So that's data points that the business already has about the end market, where the goods have ended up. And I would note there, we have no hierarchy in those data points, those indicators, which was another key change that, that we got feedback from business on. And so what we're trying to do here is, is use flexibility um, but, but having accurate information, that's always where we start with the indicators. So accuracy, but with flexibility. Then you move through the alternatives in, in this rule. And so then what we do is we acknowledge that that may not always get you all of the information you need. And so we look, what, what other information can we leverage? What other legal information and commercial intelligence can we leverage to make sure that we get information about the, the market jurisdiction here? And so we have a rule, for example, on when we can rely on the location of the distributor, or when do we know that, that goods are sold in a region, and even though we don't know the exact proportions, we can get close using an allocation key, using the information we do have. And so what we're trying to do there is, is say, how do we use what we have to sensibly approximate the end market, but without doing new information reporting uh, requirements? And then lastly, I think then we also have in mind that we need to make sure there's no gaps uh, so, that, so that all of the revenue can be sourced, um, but also keeping developing countries in mind. And so we have a spe specific allocation here, key here that gives certainty in terms of how to apply the rules when you run out of information, but making sure that all revenue is sourced. So those are some of the, the design principles that, that we have, and you'll see those throughout the rules. 
So when you get to the rule for components, when you get to the rule for cloud computing, we know that business almost always won't be able to see through a supply chain to the end market. And so those, those consistent themes about using the intelligence we have to get a good sourcing result that accommodates different business models, but that makes it possible for business to comply and have certainty about how to apply the rules. And ultimately, while making sure that we fully allocate amount A to the market as per the agreed policy. So we have to get to that policy objective, which is sourcing to the end market. So those are some of the, the design features that we had in mind as we were working on these rules. Um, and so if we turn to the next slide, that's, that's the secretariat document that we put out. That was, that was our attempt at, at, at trying to balance those considerations. Uh, and so the consultation closed last Friday. Um, so a special thanks to everyone that was able to contribute. We acknowledge it was a short time frame. Uh, but um, in, in sneak preview, um, because we'll publish tomorrow, I think we had 64 submissions and almost 400 pages of comments. Um, so a, a huge effort and, and we're, we're very grateful. Um, I think there were four main themes, if I can just spend a moment on in telling you what, what are we seeing and what will you see when you, when you read all of the comments. Four big, really consistent themes coming out in the, in the consultation. And so the first is the transaction by transaction approach. And let me spend a minute here because I think this is important and it's, it's, it's an area where there, there are two important ideas about what we were trying to do here. So the first is that we need to make sure that the right revenue is associated with each end market jurisdiction. So we need to be able to factor in cases where you charge different price points for different products or services or it's the same product or service, but you charge a different price point for different markets. So we need to be able to make sure that the sourcing gets the right, the right amount of revenue, not just the right end market jurisdiction, but associating the right amount of revenue to recognize those pricing differences. And that's, that's really what we meant as, as the functional, what, what the transaction by transaction approach was meant to deliver. Um, at the same time, the second idea that, that needs to speak to that is that we need to be able to assess compliance at a systems level. So not a full transactional invoice-based invoice audit, but a systems level review. And those two ideas need to speak to each other. And I think it was clear from the comments um, that while there was an agree, you know, agreement for the need for accuracy, that a, that a full transactional approach, which we had explained about you know, item by item, invoice by invoice, just was not doable. That it's far too granular and, and not necessary to be able to deliver that result. And we had a lot of really strong input about that, about just the enormous scale of transactions that we're talking about for businesses that are in scope of Mount A, the way systems are designed that doesn't really gel with that. Um, so that was, that was the first bit of, of um, consistent feedback we got. I think the second one was about reasonableness in context. So there are a few places in the draft rules where we proposed a test based on reasonable, reasonable steps, for example, to obtain an indicator before you move to an allocation. And we knew that there was work to do on this. Um, and so, and we were very grateful for the feedback on that so far. And on this, I think we had two big themes. The first was, we which we absolutely hear, business wants certainty about exactly what's here. And so there was a lot of concern about the subjectivity of, of reasonableness and the possibility for disputes. Have we taken enough steps? Were they the right steps? I think that the other part of the feedback we got here about reasonableness um, was, was strong feedback about the real challenges that are involved in obtaining new information. So, and, and in particular, I think the challenges involved in asking for information from customers, especially in B2B services. Uh, and we had a lot of examples, you know, where you've got many thousands of customers and there's commercial sensitivities and where it's actually not possible for the MNE to even verify that the information they might get from a customer is really the, the actual place of use of a service. So some, some really clear input about what, how we need to approach the reasonableness idea here. I think the third thing, and this I think, you know, will be a recurring theme, um, was about simplicity. 
and you know we hear that I guess I would say if you're only in the finished goods business or you're only in the, comp the components business then the rules you need for revenue sourcing are probably only two or three pages and, and the the way we've, we've built the allocation keys it's really designed to try and get to simplicity quickly but we also know that there are businesses that are in almost every category of revenue that we've written a rule for and so it is an enormous task complex businesses have complex compliance obligations. But having said that, we hear the call for simplicity and let's see if we can do better on that. And I think there were three ideas that I just wanted to mention, which I thought were interesting. We got a lot of feedback on um, the allocation keys. So this is where we say, where you've run out of information, you can allocate, for example, using macroeconomic data. A lot of support for that and a lot of, of business that would like to be able to use that more widely and more easily. Um, I think the second thing we heard was uh, ideas about can we expand the idea of, of a de minimis amount of transactions or a de minimis amount of revenue or ancillary revenue where, where you could source it in the same way majority of your, your revenue. Now we have a rule like this, the supplementary transactions rule, but there was a lot of support for that and wanting to see that apply in a bigger way. I think the third thing in terms of simplicity was, was wanting to see guidance in the commentary to avoid complex characterization rules. And so we got some good examples that we can draw on in the commentary. For example, how do we explain the difference between a finished good and a component? Um, and so that was really helpful for us to be able to tease out a bit better. The fourth and last thing that I'll mention just in terms of the, the consistent themes we were seeing in the feedback is, is recognizing the crucial link to the certainty process, which I mentioned before. A lot of calls for advanced certainty. So wanting to wanting advanced sign off that the approach that they're taking, that business is taking to their revenue sourcing, that the data that they're using is, is the right approach. And that makes a lot of sense to us. I think we know that revenue sourcing is maybe the most fact intensive part of amount A. And we know that systems build takes time. And we know that we're building something that's hugely innovative in terms of the multilateralism of this process. And so that does require certainty early for everyone about exactly what's expected. I think related to that, we heard a lot of calls for, for what you, call, you might call a soft landing. So recognizing genuine efforts, particularly in those early years where there will, it is a learning experience. This hasn't been done before. And so genuine efforts um, and, and recognizing those without going down a road of penalties too, too soon. And I think the last thing in terms of, of the importance of certainty was a call for consistency in implementation. So making sure that we write rules that are not just clear and credible and able to be applied, but the way that they're implemented domestically and in the multilateral convention to make sure that we, we do, are all on the same page. Uh, so those were some of the main themes I wanted to touch on. I think the public comments have given us a lot where we can reflect with the delegates and see where, what we can do um, to keep improving. Um, I started here with uh, a reference to the journey. Now, there's a saying that it's not about the destination, it's, it's about the journey. Although in the case of revenue sourcing for amount A, it is literally about the destination. Uh, but the journey has been really important. Uh, we're not done yet, but I did want to thank uh, the commentators for the collaboration and insight uh, and recognize the, the incredible hard work of the delegates that are working with us on this as we, as we try and take these forward. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's no such thing as a perfect set of revenue sourcing rules, but I think looking at the comments that we've had, I'm confident that we can take this input and, and make it something that's really good. So thank you again, and now I hand over to Manuel. Yeah, thank you very much, Melissa, and, and welcome everyone, <clears throat> and many thanks for, for joining us today. So just a quick update on my side on Amount B. As you perfectly know by now, the work in Amount B is progressing under the inclusive framework statement of October. And that statement requires us to undertake further work on simplifying and streamlining the application of the applicant principle to um, in-country baseline marketing and distribution activities. 
challenges. <clears throat> so I think it's clear that the main goal you know, of this mandate is to design a simplified approach that actually helps in, in reducing the significant number of transfer pricing disputes that we see at the minute regarding the pricing of baseline marketing distribution activities. And also to the, to the extent possible, to prevent those disputes from um, arising in the future. But what I think it's important to underscore when we get into the reading of the October statement is that any simplification uh, regarding the application of the principle that could be developed in the context of a Mount B has to give a special consideration to the specific needs of low capacity jurisdiction. And in undertaking this work, I think we are cognizant that those constraints can vary to some extent. So we can, we can see a um, situation where low capacity jurisdictions are wrestling with um, applying the transfer price, the conventional transfer pricing analysis that implies a number of inherent complexities. There is also another way of saying this, as like those difficulties of low capacity jurisdictions, for instance, in accessing information that eventually is critical in applying the absolute principle in a number of scenarios. And here I think we all have in mind, for instance, the well the well-known challenges uh, related with the difficulties in identifying reliable and good local comparables. Um, Sonia, if we can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so on this basis, the technical work has already started at the level of the Working Party 6 and the FDA MAP Forum, and it's been um, focusing on two main components that are going to be pretty familiar to you because these components of the amount B solutions were already outlined to a certain extent in the blueprint of October of 2020. So the first of these components is um, the definition of baseline marketing and distribution activities. And here, I guess, um, putting just that in, in, in different words, the idea is to come up with the functions, assets, and risks that an entity needs to perform, to own, or to assume in order to qualify for amount B purposes. And there are obviously a number of technical issues that need to be worked around um, when it comes to defining baseline marketing and distribution activities. Some of those that are currently under consideration by the working parties are, for instance, um, you know, the significance or the relevance of different business models, like, you know, like let's say that whether a tested party engage in a distribution agreement under a buy and sell model, or rather um, it engage in a commissioner or an agency arrangement. So those things are, uh, have to be taken into account in shaping the technical work on amount B. But also there, are, there, is, there is the issue about like how, for instance, multinational, multifunctional entities should be treated for amount B purposes, which is also like under consideration, in particular those situations where we can't imagine a, uh, an entity undertaking baseline market and distribution activities alongside with other activities that in themselves wouldn't qualify for amount B purposes. Then the second component, I think, on, on designing the solution for amount B is the pricing of those baseline marketing and distribution activities. And here, the working parties are actually focusing on how to simplify the pricing of marketing and distribution activities while still operating within the framework of the Antlion principle. There are again a number of technical aspects that the working parties are considering at the moment, like for instance, the significance and the impact that regional differences or industrial differences could have in the profitability of, of baseline marketing distribution activities. But in any case, I think picking up the point I was making at the very beginning of, of the presentation is that in progressing the technical work, I would say both the FDA map forum and the working party six are mindful of the constraints of low capacity jurisdiction and are keeping those constraints to priority in order to make sure that the technical work actually delivered uh, according to the mandate. And just to conclude on amount B, a couple of points uh, in terms of like process and timing. <clears throat> the first one is, as, as probably you already know, the game plan is to hold a public consultation on amount B by meeting. And the idea is that by then we should be able to share with you how the work in amount B has advanced and getting inputs from the public will allow us to finalize the technical work and enhance the design of amount B. And the final point, again, um, Achim was touching this at the very beginning of the presentation, is the timeline that we have in this case, in particular for amount B. So as you perfectly know already in the October statement and the implementation plan, there is a deadline by the end of 2022 where the working parties need to have had finalized 
your work on the Mount B. So I think that's that's all on my side. Thank you very much. And Achim, over to you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Manuel. I think then we're carrying on with um, uh, pillar two. And I will give you a brief sense of um, where we are. And then we have Philly C speaking um, on, we also have Lee speaking on various aspects on the global rules and then also on the uh, subject to text. So first, the obvious here is a timeline. You are aware that we released the uh, rules on the 20th of December. And I guess Pascal has already spoken about what else has happened. Switzerland, the uh, EU, we have a consultation in the UK and other things around the world are now moving forward on the pillar. I think also, as you would expect, and Pascal has already said that, we are now in the finishing, finalizing touches of the commentary that should be coming out shortly. So you will also have the commentary. And of course, we also have the question, as it says here, of guilty coexistence. And then on the um, question of what next in pillar two here, um, February slash March, I think, and Felicie will talk about this, we have a public consultation. And just to, to bring out again, what, what's the point here? So we have rules, we have a commentary, and then we have a public consultation on the implementation framework. What this means is that we want to have a very hard look, including through the public consultation, of what is the best way of implementing those rules in a way that would deliver the intended outcomes, but do so at a sensible compliance burden, I guess for companies, but, but equally for tax administrations. How can we do this? This goes to questions of filing, standardization, it goes to questions of safe harbors, what can we do in circumstances where ex ante, we know it's highly unlikely that the top up tax would arise? Can we then simplify and reduce the compliance burden associated with complying with pillar two for the jurisdictions where this is the case? Are there other aspects that we need to think about it? Do we need to think about the systems community? This is building off particular systems that already exist. So there's a whole host of questions that we will ask you to bring to us so that we can together look at it together with the policy people, with the administration people and the wider community to come up with the best possible way of implementing um, the rules of pillar two. And Felicie will speak a bit more about this. And then second, and I think that's at the point where, where Lee will go is um, the, the subject to tax rule, um, where we are on this, you know, the different components of the subject to tax rule. And then also we plan to have a public consultation on that subject to tax rule as well, which will then follow with a signing of the STTR, MLI, and the ratification for those treaties, of course, to which it relates and where it is relevant and where the conditions are met. So that's another important point. So that you see that there is the global rules that are moving as domestic rules, and we will focus on implementation the most sensible possible way, as I mentioned. And then at the same time, we're moving forward with the important subject to tax rule and I think Lee, you will be speaking to in a minute. So with that, maybe over to Felicity. Thank you, Ahim. Uh, so now uh, let me try and summarize the global rules in uh, less than five minutes. Uh, it's a challenge, but at the OECD Secretariat, you know, we like challenges. So oh, I started with four easy questions, uh, which I hope will help you uh, have a very broad understanding of how uh, the global rules work. And first, who is in scope? So we identify how many groups uh, within the scope of the global rules. Uh, those are the ones that, are, that have a consolidated revenue that exceed 750 million euros. Um, and within those groups, we can identify constituent entities and excluded entities. Uh, having an excluded entity within the group doesn't mean that the group becomes out of scope, of course. Uh, the underlying group remains within the scope but the excluded entities are not subject to the operative provisions of the global rules. So that's what it means uh, in relation to the scope. Now uh, you have heard about the 15% minimum tax rate, uh, and you may know that we look at an effective tax rate. Uh, how to know whether the effective tax rate of an MNE group is below 15% and whether a minimum tax is, needs to be paid. The effective tax rate is computed on a jurisdictional basis. 
which means that the MNE will need to compute the effective tax rate for each jurisdiction where it is operating. This also means that there can still be a low tax entity within a jurisdiction and a, and a high tax entity within the same jurisdiction. And if the two together um, result in an effective tax rate that is higher than 15%, then no type of tax would be due. Um, to compute an effective tax rate, you need two things. Uh, you need income and taxes, of course, and it's the ratio of taxes over income. Uh, first, to identify the income of the m &E group within a jurisdiction, we start with the financial account, and uh, we make a, number, a limited number of adjustments that are, are relatively familiar for tax practitioners. Uh, these consist of uh, deducting some uh, income that is not taxable or adding back some expenses uh, that uh, are not allowed to be deducted. And then we need, of course, to uh, identify the amount of taxes that relate to this income. Uh, and we uh, include not only the, the taxes that are labeled as corporate income taxes, uh, but we have broad understanding of what uh, income taxes can mean. And uh, we also include different tax expense to some extent uh, to accommodate for uh, timing differences uh, to ensure that uh, if there is tax that is uh, for sure being paid within a, a short time frame, uh, then it will also be uh, credited for the taxpayer for computing the effective tax rate. And because we follow a jurisdictional approach, there, there will be some cases where income uh, and taxes will need to be allocated to a given jurisdiction. For instance, I'm thinking of permanent establishments. And the underlying principle that we have is that the taxes will follow uh, the, in, the, the income. Now, assume that uh, the m and &E is operating in a jurisdiction where uh, the effective tax rate is below 15%. Uh, then it will uh, it may need to pay top of tax. The top of tax is the amount of tax that is necessary to bring uh, the effective tax rate up to 15% in each jurisdiction. Still, there are some exceptions. Uh, for instance, if uh, the operations of the MNE are limited because they are below a certain revenue amount or a set, and a certain income uh, within the jurisdiction, then the de minimis exclusion could apply and no top of tax would be due in respect of that jurisdiction. There could also be the substance-based carve-out that applies and that excludes from uh, the application of the rules a portion of the income that is computed as a percentage of the payroll expenses and the carrying value of the assets of the m &E within a given jurisdiction. So to take a practical example, it could be that there is a jurisdiction where the effective tax rate is at 10%, say, but if the income does not exceed um, the, the substance-based carve-out, then there would be no type of tax that is due with respect to that jurisdiction. Now, assume this is not the case and type of tax needs to be paid. Uh, the last question is where, is where does it need to be paid? Because there, is, there are coordinating rules uh, within the group rules. And the first priority is given to the jurisdiction itself uh, because the jurisdiction where the ME has some operations could impose a qualified domestic minimum type of tax. This would be a, top, a tax that mirrors uh, the the operation of the globe rules uh, has the same uh, base, for instance, and uh, that would collect the amount of tax that would be due under the globe rules. If there is no such domestic top of tax, then the uh, income inclusion rule would apply first, because uh, we wouldn't want all the countries to uh, that have the globe rules to uh, apply uh, the uh, to collect the top of tax at the same time. So there is a, a rule order that applies, a rule a rule order between the rules themselves and between the countries that have the same rule. So first, the IAR applies uh, at the top of the ownership chain. And if there is no IAR that applies, then there would be the UTPR that applies. And here, uh, the way to ensure that not all countries tax uh, the same amount of income, there, there is an allocation key that ensures uh, that all the countries only get a portion of the top of tax uh, to, to collect. So that's it for uh, the overview. If we go to the next slide uh, where we have the next steps, uh, what the inclusive framework members uh, have wanted to do is uh, to have a model rules and a commentary to ensure that all of them have uh, that all of them that want to implement the rules will have the same starting point. But they actually want to go further, and that's why uh, the October statement referred to the global implementation framework that would be developed before the end of 2022, and that would cover uh, several issues, as you can see on the slide that relate to the administration, the compliance and the coordination issues 
uh, relating to the global rules. The idea is to facilitate a coordinated implementation of the global rules because uh, the, the inclusive frameworks would, uh, of course, um, rely on each other uh, for, for the coordination of the rules. Uh, now, if we say a word about the public consultation that is uh, going to happen very soon, uh, you have seen that there are several aspects of the global implementation framework that will actually benefit from stakeholder, stakeholder input. Uh, business you know, will need to apply the rules and, and they also know best how uh, the system is, could be put in place to comply with the rules. So the public consultation will cover, for instance, uh, the filing requirements uh, because each group will have the information in different formats and there may be ways, of course, to accommodate those uh, in the most effective and efficient manner. And as you may have seen in the model rules, uh, there is a placeholder for possible uh, administrative safe harbors. Uh, which could allow a tax administration to uh, consider that an MNE has an effective tax rate that is above the minimum rate in some jurisdictions if it meets some requirement. Uh, those are the safe harbors and those still need to be developed and consultation will of course be very important here as well because there is no point in developing safe harbors that are of no use for MNEs. So we will want to hear from you uh, about that. So with that, as you can see, we still have uh, some work to do uh, and you will hear from us very soon. And, and with that, Ali, uh, now I pass it on to Lee um, to talk about the subject of tax. And, and maybe just before we go to Lee for one second, before we leave the globe rules here, I think I, think I should have said the same also in pillar one, you know, a big thank you also for those in the business community and the bag that have helped us, especially on the commentary before we come to the implementation. So I know that there's certain members that haven't slept a month to provide the business input. So I think we will be having a, consultation, I think, on the implementation, but first of all, also, I, I thank you for the input that we have received, that from the business advisory group, but also from, from other stakeholders like the BEPS monitoring group. So, so just to say that before we move on to information, thank you so far. And with that, over to Lee. Thank you, Akim. Thank you, Belisi. Um, so here, I'll take you through the work that's underway and nearing completion uh, on the subject of tax rule or STTR, uh, and then let you know what's coming up soon in terms of public consultation. The, the STTR, you'll remember from the October statement, it's a treaty-based rule. It gives source jurisdictions limited taxing rights over certain related party payments that are subject to tax in the residence jurisdiction at a, relate, a rate below the 9% STTR minimum rate. Now, it's an integral part of the overall consensus on Pillar 2. It's especially important to developing countries. There are four broad streams to our work on the subject of tax rule. First, we're developing the provision itself. So this is a model treaty provision to be included in tax treaties and reflects the agreed design features of the rule. So it's a rule that applies to certain related party payments where those payments are subject to tax at rates below 9%. And then it allows the source jurisdiction to tax the payment at a rate up to 9%. Of course, an important design feature of the rule is the scope of payments it will apply to. It was agreed in the October statement that the rule will apply to interest, to royalties, and to a defined set of other payments, and discussions on that last category have continued. Associated with the provision and being developed alongside it is a detailed commentary on the operation and effect of the model rule. There are some ongoing discussions, but work on both the provision and the commentary is advanced, and will be the subject of upcoming public consultation. Then we have two work streams focused on the implementation of the STTR. In the October statement, remember it was agreed that IF members applying rates below 9% will implement the STTR in their treaties when requested to do so by developing countries. Developing countries here means countries with a GNI per capita of 12,535 US dollars or less in 2019, with that measure being updated at intervals. We're developing a process to support jurisdictions during that implementation stage with a focus on assisting developing countries. And we're developing a new multilateral instrument to facilitate the swift and coordinated implementation of the STTR in the affected tax treaties. It's envisaged that that instrument would operate in a similar way to the BEPS multilateral instrument, the BEPS MLI, and modify the application of existing treaties to give effect to the rule in those treaties. 
All of that work is underway in Working Party One. And as you saw when Akin presented the timeline earlier, its completion comes in stages. The first stage is to finalize the development of the model treaty provision and the associated commentary. That's our current priority and takes us through to the end of March. Alongside that, we've started the work on implementation and the process to support jurisdictions with that. And we would want to have that in place by mid 2022, when the multilateral instrument to facilitate the implementation of the STTR will be open for signature. And of course, we need to develop that multilateral instrument itself and the explanatory statement that will accompany it so that that can be agreed and open for signature in the ceremony planned for mid 2022. So as the timeline that Akin took you through shows, these things are being done in parallel in the working party with the provision and the commentary coming at the end of March. And you'll see this in the consultation document. And then the focus turning to the completion of the tools that we need to facilitate implementation, which will follow in the middle of 2022. So then if I turn to the public consultation for which we have a slide, what can you expect to see from us? We'll be releasing two public consultation documents. The first is a draft of the model treaty provision and its commentary. And here we'll be inviting comments focused especially on the application and administration of the rule. And we'll be releasing a separate public consultation draft on the development of the multilateral instrument. And in that one, we'll be seeking input on specific technical questions that may arise from implementing the subject to tax rule in existing treaties in that way. It, it won't include the text of the multilateral instrument itself, which is a treaty between governments and subject to negotiation, uh, but we'll set out the approach that we will take and the questions that can arise from that on which we'll be seeking input. Those of you with good, with good memories will remember that we carried out a similar exercise when we were developing the BEPS MLI. As the timeline you saw earlier said, we're planning to issue both of those uh, discussion drafts in March. Um, so that's coming. Um, I think that's uh, everything uh, where we're at and what's coming on the subject of tax rule. And uh, I believe I now hand back to you, Pascal. Thank you, Lee, and thanks uh, to the team for uh, the presentation. It took a bit more time than um, we initially thought, but I think it was really uh, helpful. So what I suggest, so that we have a, a few minutes uh, for the Q&A session, is to walk you through very quickly on the other work streams, and maybe we can do a dedicated um, tax talks later, or you will just have the slide for your own reference. Tax and development to start with, and that one, I think I will not skip because it's extremely important. Next slide. You can see here that uh, the G20 is asking us uh, for being very active, recognizing uh, the work in particular in the Asia Pacific uh, region, uh, which will be, by the way, one of the priorities of the new Secretary General of the OECD. The other thing I would like to mention as regards developing countries is the fact that we'll have to reflect on what the impact of Pivot 2 is on the tax policy of developing countries in particular, in terms of putting an end to wasteful tax incentives. I would like to thank Jamaica for the very good work and uh, the minister's involvement in organizing the roundtable, which took place in November last uh, year. And uh, I would also like to thank Indonesia for taking on the um, um, succession of the Italian presidency. Italy did put on the agenda work on tax and development. We did produce a report on tax and development and the Indonesian presidency is asking us to follow up in particular organizing a G20 tax symposium on tax and development, which will take place in July. Next, very quickly on the developments there, happy to announce that there will be a co-chair of the inclusive framework. And I think we haven't mentioned yet that Fabrizia La Pecorella uh, from Italy uh, was elected chair of the inclusive framework. She will have a co-chair elected in the coming weeks. Uh, and we're extremely happy uh, to have uh, Fabrizia. You can see other work, tax inspectors without uh, borders, a new um, uh, set of numbers showing how successful it is and uh, other work with, again, focus on tax incentive. Next will be on 
the tax transparency work. If we can move to the tax transparency work. Extremely important uh, stuff uh, there. Uh, I think we have another leaks, uh, Swiss uh, secrets or whatsoever, which I think is largely old story um, uh, in terms of, of files, uh, but showing that this issue of transparency is still extremely important. Uh, and I think that uh, the progress made on exchange of information is recognized uh, in the analysis of the papers uh, and uh, just shows that we always need to fine tune and uh, go further, which is the case. Uh, the Working Party 10 recently agreed an update of common reporting standard, including to cover crypto assets will go soon for a public consultation, hopefully in March, even though I cannot confirm a date which has not yet been agreed by the uh, Committee on Fiscal Affairs. If we move further to the next one, tax administration, there was a meeting of the tax commissioners, and I would just like to highlight the administration 3.0 as a big avenue for further work. And, and, and I think we, we all need to reflect on what the recent progress overall, including the recent technology pro, uh, progress, uh, will uh, mean in terms of translating uh, into a uh, efficient tax cooperation mechanism with information exchange, protection of the confidentiality. All these elements need to be thought through, uh, including the transformation of tax administration. Next, quickly, on the uh, tax and gender, uh, there will be dedicated um, uh, seminars on this one, but we are all, again very thankful to the Indonesian presidency for having identified this work stream as uh, a priority of their presidency. We released a tax and uh, gender um, report. You will see the findings there, but uh, it covers uh, more than 40 countries half of them recognizing that there is an implicit bias uh, in their system uh, which does not favor women. We need to change that and we're very happy to uh, go on with that work. I think with that, uh, we uh, have been through the other work streams, except one, which I will not mention because it uh, will take more than, it would take more than three minutes. It's carbon pricing. We do work and you can see taxing energy use effective carbon rates, which is our output. And the goal of the Secretary General of the OECD is to be able to build an inclusive framework on carbon pricing, explicit pricing, effective pricing, which is what we work on, taxes, emission trading system, uh, excise duties, but also um, uh, implicit carbon pricing, what would be the equivalent price of non-price-based mitigation policies. There is a lot to do work. Tax is only one aspect of that story, uh, and we will be working with our colleagues from environment, our colleagues from uh, uh, the economic department, um, um, the chief economist in particular, Laurence Boone. So maybe we should do a dedicated uh, um, tax talks uh, on this. Uh, and we will do, so I will not develop further, but you have three slides showing why this is a topic of extreme importance. We can go right to the end on the next step. Uh, coming up, Peter 1, Peter 2 consultations. We heard the frustration of the public with the lack of consultation. I think now we will hear about the frustration of leaving too little time for the consultation, but we know we all have deadlines fixed by the political masters, and we think that with this rolling mechanism uh, on Peter one in particular, you will be able to input. Um, and uh, there is more to come, uh, tax morale, uh, part-time work, uh, the uh, future of work in a, in a more mobile environment, fixing and addressing illicit financial flows with a survey on South Africa, the March on Gender, drawing on our report or being able to use our reports a lot on our agenda, while we are actually putting the priorities right, delivering on pillar one, delivering on pillar two. And with that, I will stop and maybe turn to Hazel for having a couple of questions. I know it's uh, just uh, one hour that uh, we started uh, this uh, meeting, but we may take an additional five minutes. I hope that uh, we still have uh, some of the audience. Uh, I noted that we went up to almost 2,000 uh, people connected. So thanks 
for your interest and we can just take a couple of questions, but I promise that the next tax talks will not be in one year time, but much earlier. Hazel, maybe one or two questions. Thank you. Yeah, Pascal, we'll actually stay with you. Um, is there a way to anticipate how developing countries would react to Pillar 2 on BEPS? Actually, very good question. I, I hinted on the fact that uh, the Indonesian presidency of the G20 is making this issue a priority. Tax incentives, developing countries, pivot two. And with these third terms, with these three terms, you can see that there is a need to reflect to, to reflect all together. I mean, there is now, there is going to be a minimum tax. And we can see that a number of countries are introducing this minimum tax to take the 15%, the effective 15%. So I think developing countries, even though they were more focused, like some other countries, I mean, the French and the others, on uh, Peter one, I think should reflect quickly on what this means for the wasteful tax incentives. I mean, you see, I'm qualifying their tax incentives. Uh, some of them may not be wasteful, but most of them are wasteful as per the findings of the IMF or the OECD or the World Bank or the UN or many other international organizations. So we need to reflect on that. More to come. And the G20 tax symposium this summer will be dedicated to this issue. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Akim, um, I have a question for you here. Uh, what measures have been taken to soften the complexity, avoid double or multiple taxation, and give access to dispute resolution? Uh, that's a big question I can answer in the next hour. If you have another day, stay with me and I will answer this question. I'll try to sort of just hit a couple of points in 30 seconds, if I may. And it's certainly never enough, so we're going to continue on working, and you've heard from PLC. Uh, what we have in mind for safe harbor and other things on implementation so more to come but sort of i think the delegates in pillar two starting with pillar two for a second as i'm looking at felicity i think it 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 it, it took people um uh, quite a bit to design the rules and think about some of the implication already as they were as they were designing them so so what are the, some of the things that they try to sort of simplify some of that well first Scoping. I mean, the scoping for Pillar 2 largely relies on CDC as a simplification. People know the CDC. Then financial accounts, you know, use of financial accounts, allow different financial statements, use the parent entity accounts, minimize, maybe we should have minimized more, but minimize the book to tax adjustments, allow the use of entity level accounts with some level of materiality. So if you dig in there, there's a couple of these things that we did. At the end of the day, also allow a system that's based on deferred tax accounting, sort of a big ask from business. We know what there are still adjustments to the deferred tax accounting where we had back and forth with business advisory, various stakeholders, what that is. But in principle, not a carry forward approach. I think that was another thing that is simpler, even if we still have certain adjustments in the deferred tax account. But the minimus exclusion, also something that if it's very small, we can take it out. And then not to forget, you know, we had a long discussion on the income inclusion rule go first, the under tax payment rule to go first, and largely on the basis of efficiency of simplicity of administrability, I think we did go for the IRR first. I mean, the bright line tests, we use mechanical tests, less tax and circumstances, all of that is to some degree helpful. And of course, as I said, now that we're moving forward, we're still thinking about other things that we can do in the implementation, such as safe harbors and other things that really see, I think has mentioned. On pillar one, um, just a word, of course, you know, sort of one of the biggest simplification arguably is, you know, the scope limitations. You know, we, we're talking about the biggest of the big, you know, sort of and the highly profitable. So scope questions and scoping out. And then for those in scope, I think we're trying to, so as Melissa has explained, take on board things to make the rules workable, things that build on existing data system, thinking of things that we do in the wider tax certainty agenda, building on control frameworks and systems approaches. So, so to give people confidence, but sort of do it in a sense that's reasonable and proportionate and listening to particular companies, particular issues, and try to work with them to sort of come to things that can be implemented. Then also the use of financial accounts, same in Pillar 1, I think, and then the use of a formulaic approach and not effects and circumstances. And importantly, then early tax certainty in Pillar 1, something that we want to give you sensible rules, practical rules, but then also ensure that we have process so that we not only agree the same rules, but then we apply them together so that we avoid double taxation, both for amount A and then also importantly for the existing transfer pricing and other adjustments. And then finally, something that, you know, still to be done, the administrative system. How close can we get to a one-stop shop? What's possible? So some of these things stay tuned still to come. So a long answer to a short question. Thank you very much, Akim. 
I'm very, very sorry, but we are out of time. Um, so Pascal, I will just hand over to you just for a final word. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you, uh, Hazel, and those who organized and participated to the panel. I would like to thank uh, those uh, who uh, listen in. Uh, thanks a lot for bearing with us. Uh, we appreciate your involvement uh, in the work, uh, your contributions, whether you're business, NGOs, uh, or, 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 or taxpayers. Um, this is hard work. We are at a time where I think we're changing environments. We are moving from one era to another one. There will be hiccups, difficulties, but we need to get it right. We have a few more months ahead of us uh, in a very constrained political environment. Um, we have heard uh, some concern about public consultation and we are glad to provide opportunities for the public uh, to comment. And again, we appreciate your input. Um, please bear with us a few more months, a few more years, a few more decades, I suppose, but for the time being, we just need to get uh, the MLC right, the Pillar 2 rules, uh, the GLOBE rules right, the uh, MLI for the subject to tax uh, rule, the amount P, which is extremely important. You can see these four comp components of uh, the agreed uh, package. That's the top priority, and I suggest that uh, in the next couple of months, we get back to you to update you on where we stand. On that note, thanks a lot and uh, hope to see you soon.